Oh, hello, hello, hello. Hello. We have been having some technical difficulties, but we're getting through it. <laughs> can we hear uh can we hear out there okay? Yes. See, sí, gracias. <laughs> can you hear okay? Yes. Yes, okay. So <laughs> thank you, God. <laughs> And thank you, Nikki. <laughs> Thinking about just checking. Let's just check the connection. Oh, what, what an idea! <laughs> yeah, all these technical people were doing all this technical stuff. Nikki comes up and says, "Why don't we just check this connection?" Oops, there we are. So we're on here and now. And uh, my name is Bethel. I am the president of the Unity Namaste in Ahihik, and uh, I'm here to welcome you. So I hope you feel welcome and loved because we certainly do love you all. All of you out in Zoomland and all of you here. I would like to start with a prayer. And since we're not having any music today, I decided to sing my prayer, or at least part of it. <clears throat> I forgot to vocalize. La 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 la. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> la 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 <laughs> la. <laughs> so <clears throat> here is the prayer, and it's a blessing. May the blessings of God rest upon you. May God's peace abide in you. May God's presence illuminate your heart now and forevermore. I learned that little song at Unity Village where I went for a retreat and there were over a hundred people facing each other doing this blessing and then we would change and another person would come up. After a while, doing that over and over and over, you really did see the Christ. There was no person standing before you. It really was Christ. So that's a very special blessing to me because that probably was the first time and that was probably back in mm, late 80s maybe. Uh, probably the first time that I truly saw the Christ in everyone. It was just beautiful. So I hope today that you will see the Christ and every person you see today, and it doesn't matter if you know them, it doesn't matter if you talk to them. All that matters is when you look at them, you see the Christ. And automatically what happens is blessings go out and they will feel it. And they'll smile at you. They're not even sure why they're smiling, but they will. They'll smile at you because they feel that love being projected out. Oops, I hit the whole thing. Anyway, I gotta quit using my hands so much. So, <laughs> but I do have just a, a teeny bit of Italian in me, so I, I, I have to use my hands. It's a, it's a rule or a law or something. <laughs> so anyway, that's for that's the welcome. Either good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. This is your welcome and, and your prayer to start the day. And now I'm going to read for you today's daily word. And the word today is gather. We gather and magnify the presence of God. So every time we gather, we are magnifying the presence of God. Sunday, April 24th, 2022. As I gather with others in the spirit of love and peace, my awareness of God's presence becomes more powerful, even palpable. Together, 
we create an energy, a vibration, greater than any of us alone can do. I am comfortable and at ease when I notice our differing appearances, preferences, backgrounds, and opinions, because I am reminded of the limitless diversity of divine expression and my place in it. When I join in fellowship with family, friends, and all others, Oh, okay, I got it too big now, I can't read it. Who are dear to me, all others who are dear to me, each of us becomes a mirror for the others. So you are my mirrors. And when I look out and see those smiling faces, wow, that's a great mirror to see. We see in one another the divine presence that lives in and expresses as every person the unifying energy of divine love unites and binds us together in this love we are one and this comes from psalms 133 verse 1 how very good and pleasant it is when kindred, kindred live together in unity. How about that? Away from, they're still talking about unity. Well, how long was that ago? Psalms must have been written, what, 5,000 years ago? 4,000? I don't know. Long time ago. Long time ago. Before Namaste. They already knew about unity way back then. Psalms. Who wrote Psalms? King David? Hmm, not sure. Anyway, whoever wrote it had a lot of foresight. <laughs> so I want to bless you all today, and I want to introduce to you our wonderful speaker. And is this our, your, our last Sunday with it you? Is, yes. Oh, this is our last Sunday with Reverend Larry. Do you know who's coming next? I believe it's um, Megan and Michael. Somebody? I don't know the last name. But oh, anyway. Next Sunday, we'll have a new person. <laughs> but today, we have Reverend Larry, and we are so happy to welcome him there. Come on up, Reverend Larry. <laughs> and I am so glad to still be with you. And yes, and thank you for your understanding of the technology. Um, all I can say is I'm so grateful that we don't have to rely on technology to connect with each other. Aren't you? I mean, if we had to like tweak our operating systems and our <laughs> communication devices, and we had to be in the same network zone just to have a conversation, we would certainly be at a disadvantage. It would be very unnatural. But we are grateful that we have this technology, and when it works, we know that we can extend our communication out beyond you know where we physically are. So we bless it and we forgive it, and we are grateful. To move on. So, with that said, I thought it would be um, what I was motivated to do this morning was to sort of continue on the Easter theme. Are you guys okay with that? Yes. Because I was thinking how we just, you know, we look at Easter, you know, it's a holiday, it's, it's Sunday, one Sunday a year. And yet the message of Easter is so powerful. And it is not just something, honestly, that occurs in a single moment of time. It is the resurrection principle lives in us and it, it's alive in us in every moment in time. So I wanted to sort of like take it off of the altar of a singular recognition, a singular celebration, and make it something that we can work with every day of our life. Are you up for that? Yeah. Would that be oh, yes. appropriate? Yes. yes, because God knows we need resurrections every day of our life. Yes? Yes. Because don't you know that there's little and big crucifixions along the way of life? <laughs> so, you know, th and that's what is so, I think, wonderful in the story you know, of old, where, you know, Jesus willingly goes into Jerusalem and he has the whole, he knows the whole scenario. He knows what's going to happen, right? And he goes in there and, and everyone is like incredulous, like, Jesus, 
<laughs> what are you thinking? I mean, you could just stay up in, you know, Nazareth where all your friends and fans are, you know? And he says, no, this is what I must do. But was that because Jesus was focused on the crucifixion? Or he was seeing what? The resurrection. The resurrection. And I think that's just really instructive because it's that ability that you and I have to look beyond the trials and the tribulations and the challenges of life and know that there's something greater in which we are not diminished, in which we are invulnerable to the travails, to the trials of life. And Jesus knew that. It wasn't just something that he had to see, what's that affirmation again? Life is eternal, you know. He knew that in the core of his being, and that's what you and I are here, to extend and expand our understanding of the presence and the power and the love of God, that it is an ongoing, ever-present, never, can never be interrupted experience of love in life. And in, in that knowing, then we can sort of be courageous and we can enter into life, even those situations that are difficult for us, knowing that you know, there's an opportunity for us to experience the greater self that we are, and not the little self that is so vulnerable and needs everything to be a certain way. Yes? Yes. Yes. You can feedback. It's fine with you. It's like one of those Baptist churches where amens are all welcome here. Just stand up and say it. So I'm, I've been reading a book, and I sort of go in and, and, go in and out of this book, but it, it's always a, a rich resource. Uh, and it's written by um, uh, Father Richard Ruhr, who is a Franciscan uh, priest, and he is a very progressive, open-minded, non-dual, you could even say, um, priest in, in the Catholic tradition, Franciscan tradition, in which uh, he embraces, you know, the, the truth that we, we know in unity, which is that there is no singular understanding of God, that, that the presence and the power and the love of God is an everywhere present from, uh, reality. And so he wrote this book, and the book is called Falling Upward. Falling Upward. And so that's sort of the, my, my title today, Falling Upward. <clears throat> and he's got some wonderful quotes in there. And one of them is from Carl Jung, who says, the greatest and the most important problems of life are fundamentally unsolvable fundamentally unsolvable. They can never be solved. They are only outgrown. They are only outgrown. And this is really sort of the, the teaser for this message, and really the message of, of, of Master Teacher Jesus, was that the problems that you think you have are not the problems, is not really the problem. The Course of Miracles also references this over again, the problem, you know, has already been solved, right? And then what the Course of Miracles says, let me recognize what the problem is and let me recognize that the problem has already been solved. So when we're trying to solve the problems of our life and we're working at the level of the problem, as Einstein said, that's not where the solution is. We have to get to a higher consciousness, yes? And so that's what spiritual growth is, that's what enlightenment is, that's what's growing up into a, a deeper and a more profound understanding of who and what we truly are. And then Julian of Norwich, referencing the fall, she says, and she's a Christian mystic, she says, first there is the fall, then there is the recovery from the fall, and both are the mercy of God. First there is the fall, then there is the recovery from the fall, and both are the mercy of God. We have to remember that God is in every moment, yes? In every situation, no matter what it looks like. And that that power and that presence transcends as human beings when we are stuck in a notion that we are a separate self. That, that knowing of that power and that love is, is that which allows us to know that God is here. God is in the midst of this. And we can access that knowing in the midst of life's biggest problems where we don't have to solve the problem at the level of the problem. We can solve the problem by realizing there really is the problem when we know who and what we are. Does that make sense? And it is a stretch sometimes. I will get into my own story in a minute. Einstein talked about this, this notion that we, we call the presence of God. 
he called it the unified field, more kind of came, came from a physics perspective. And he said, it's the single world of elementary forces, principles, and particles that hold together the entire universe in time and in space. And he spent his whole life searching for this, this kind of like all-inclusive explanation, yes? And, um, and we and I have been spending our whole life trying to understand what's it all about, Alfred, right? What, what is the big picture, right? And um, what we want to know is not just, we don't want a, an affirmation. We don't want just some, you know, like clever little... Um, Jingle. What do you say? Jingle. Jingle, yeah, or, or platitudes, because platitudes are lovely, but they usually don't hit our heart. They usually stay in our head. Right? But what we want to know is, we want to know what is true. What is the truth? And what we want to know about that truth is the truth that is always the same. We're not interested in the, the dualistic idea of truth, like, you know, I'm happy when I'm getting what I want, and I'm not happy when I'm not getting what I want, and when she loves me, I feel loved, and when she doesn't love me, I don't. And, you know, we understand that's, that's the conditional truth of life, right? So what is the truth that is always true? Jesus' metaphor for that is the reign of God, the reign of God, or what's the other expression that's more common? Grace. Yes, grace. Um, kingdom of God, he called it a kingdom. And he said that this kingdom uh, is, is the big picture, right? That makes all the smaller pictures um, make sense. So, if I'm looking at where my struggle has been in my spiritual journey, it has not been that I didn't study enough, and that I didn't learn enough, that I didn't read enough books, I didn't go to enough workshops, or any of those things that we do on the path. It was that my context for life in general has just been too small. I have continue to look at life through the narrow lens of my senses, of, of what appears to be what's happening, and I don't have a large enough context to, to, to embrace all of what arises in life. And it's that larger context of life that gives us a sense that there's something bigger going on here, and I don't have to be subject to the rising and falling of circumstances for my well-being. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? That, you know, it's sort of like a metaphor people sometimes use is they say, look at your problem, you know, what you normally would at whatever distance. And now imagine now that you would go up above, you know, higher up, like in a hot air balloon, and you're looking down at that situation that is so troubling to you. Excuse me. And you're looking down on that situation so troubling to you, and the higher you go, the more of other things come into your view, right? Whereas if, you know, if I'm looking at my problem like this, all I see is my problem, right? But if I bring my problem out, or if I bring myself back from it, then I notice the problem, and then I notice all this space around it, all these other possibilities. And I believe that, that that's what Jesus was talking about when he said, do not judge by appearances, but by righteous judgment. Expand your view. You know, it's not just, that's not the only thing happening, but if I'm identified as an individual, as a finite being that's going to, you know, lives and, and ages and dies in time, and that's my only understanding of myself, then life has to be a particular way for me to be okay, right? But if I know myself to be an infinite being, which God knows, and God had created us in its image and likeness, if I know that, then my problems are seen as just inconveniences on this trajectory, which is an infinite um, expression of life. Yes? Okay, good. So I'm going to read a little bit from the book. You haven't had a, somebody read to you in a while, probably, so enjoy this one. It just says it so well, I just can't, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, what do you call it? Paraphrase. Paraphrase, thank you. Okay, so this is from a chapter called The Way Up and The Way Down, okay? The soul, he says, has many secrets. And one of the best kept secrets, and yet one hidden in plain sight, is that the way up is the way 
down. The way up is the way down. Or if you prefer, the way down is the way up. This pattern is obvious in all of nature, from the very change of seasons and substances on this earth to the 600 million tons of hydrogen that the sun burns every day to light and warm the earth. So every day, the sun is burning up in order to light up your life and to warm you. Dying, right? And even to the metabolic, <clears throat> oops, I went too fast. <laughs> Even to the metabolic laws of dieting or fasting, the down-up pattern is constant too. And in mythology and stories like the story of Persephone, who must descend into the underworld and marry Hades for spring to be reborn. In legends and literature, sacrifice of something to achieve something else is almost the only pattern that you see this pattern of dying and life and resurrection. Dr. Faust has to sell his soul to the devil to achieve power and knowledge. Sleeping Beauty must sleep for a hundred years before she can receive the prince's kiss. In scripture, we see that the wrestling and the wounding of Jacob are something else necessary for Jacob to become Israel. And the death and the resurrection of Jesus are necessary to create Christianity. The loss and renewal pattern is so constant and ubiquitous that it should hardly be called a secret at all. Yet it is still a secret, probably because we do not want to see it. We do not want to embark on a further journey if it feels like going down, right? Especially after we have put so much sound and fury into going up, right? This is surely the first and primary reason why many people never get to the fullness of their own lives. The supposed achievements of the first half of life have to fall apart and show themselves to be wanting in some way, or we will not move further. Why would we? Now, some people hear this and they think, and particularly in unity, they think, that's just like Pollyannish, spiritual, eye candy, uh, just ways of making, you know, what is really tough sound better and make us all feel better. But I think most of us in this room probably, and out in Zoomlandia, would know that this is true. That it's not in the epiphanies of our life when everything is going along swimmingly that we have our deepest realization of the truth. It's typically when what we have been clinging to and holding to be the truth gets upended, gets pulled out from under us, including our own understanding of who and what we are, that we have identified with all along because we've been conditioned to do that. We're, we're raised by our parents to, you know, to live with this notion that we are a body and that we have a mind and to develop our mind and to develop our bodies and take care of our bodies. And we know how vulnerable our bodies is. And we know how we have these feelings and people hurt our feelings. And it just seems like it's a constant work in progress. We're trying to protect ourselves, right? Because we're identified as this finite, vulnerable human being. And when life comes along and really challenges that, when we have a major, maybe a major illness, or we have a bankruptcy in our life, or, or we lose a relationship with some of them who we were so identified with, and we were a husband or a wife, or we were someone's lover, or we were, or we lost a career where we, you know, we were somebody we were looked up to, and we were seen, you know, through the eyes of other people. We we had self-respect and we had dignity, and then that job situation goes away. Those are the moments that are ripe opportunities for spiritual growth and unfoldment, because then we have to ask the question: Who am I now? Who am I? Now? So I'm going to share a short version of my little story. And I'm, I'm probably going to write this into a book. Um, but we'll see. I've said that before, years ago. <laughs> but I've certainly written a lot of articles about it. But 
Um, and so the story is this. So I, you all know I'm a minister. Well, I, about 20 years ago, after my first ministry, I finished my five-year contract. And Denise and I started sending out a resume six months before we left. Take plenty of time to find another ministry. And well, uh, nothing happened. So our time there came to an end. And so we literally, we had to give up our house, you know, that goes, we had, to, we had a lease, we had to give that up. And so on, on this last day of our job, uh, we, we packed up our two kids. We had a, um, a three-year-old and a 14-year-old. And we, had, we headed off in our van, pulling a little tin trailer behind us. And we were homeless, which, um, is not as adventurous as it sounds. <laughs> we were intrigued. We we're doing the unity. Oh, won't this be an adventure? Where should we go? Wherever there's a campground, we can go. So we headed up to Ale Tahoe, which is one of our favorite places. And we camped at a place called Blue Lake. And we were there. We had a two week reservation. When that two weeks was up, we still didn't have a job. We didn't have a place to live. So we ended up um, contacting the Unity Church in Lake Tahoe, and they were gracious enough to say, well, we need guest speakers, so if you'd like to come, um, and we have a little apartment that you can stay in, you know, for a short time. And so we said, okay, that's great. So um, the long story of it was that my wife, Denise, was actually hired by that church to uh, be the minister at a very low salary. I mean, about a fourth of what we needed to live on but it was something. So I was continuing to send out all these resumes and I sent out 17 resumes. I got five interviews. And out of those five interviews, I had three churches that said, we would love to have you come. You're in the finals. You know, we, we had uh, a limit, they'd gotten it down to three people and I was one of the three. So all was well, I thought, until I went through the process, and this was Hawaii, Bellevue, Washington, and a couple of other places. I went through all the processes, and at the end, I came in second place each time. So thank you, thank you, bless you, but no, God bless you. So the answer is no, the answer is no, but it's just sort of enough teasing in there to know that, you know, you're not completely chopped liver, you know, you know, you have some value that was perceived, but still no the job. Answer is no. Yeah, the answer is no. Yeah. But, yeah. H have you ever not accepted a no? Uh, well, you just can't believe the answer is no? Because you have this whole, all this whole litany of reasons why you know that you, the answer should be yes. I mean, you've got, you know, I was the voted best speaker in my class. I had a successful ministry for five years. I mean, every other reason, you know, that I should be said yes to, but it was a no, and it remained a no. So I got really depressed. I really did, because I thought God had led me to do this work. And, and, and I, would, I had made so many sacrifices. Here's my story, right? So many sacrifices <laughs> to do this. And now, is, it, is, is, is the end game of this going to be that we're going to be bankrupt and we're going to be homeless? And, and you know, yeah, you know how that goes, right? Bombs in the street. Yeah, you make stories up that just match with your sense of disconnection yeah. with the truth of who you are. And of course, you know, it's humanly understandable, but. It wasn't serving me very well. I was not. Ha I was not a happy camper to be in the household, right? So, one day, um, my my son, he was eight years old at the time, our youngest, and we decided to go for a hike. We wanted to see this waterfall up in Lake Tahoe. It's above Emerald Bay. If any of you know where that is, very beautiful. So we're climbing up this rocky, you know, side of of, of a mountain, and uh, we went for about fifteen minutes and. My son said, you know, Dad, I'm getting tired. And I said, yeah, fine, we'll just sit down and rest. So, so we sat down, we rested, and we, it was, it's sort of uh, where the trees are getting a little bit thinner, and so there's a lot of granite and rocks and things. So we sat down on this big granite slab. And where normally I probably would not even have noticed this, as we were sitting there, I looked down, and there was a, there was a crack in, the, in this, in this uh, granite slab. And growing out of this crap was this 
perfectly formed little fern. It was, you know, maybe about three inches around. And it was perfect in form, very diminutive, very small, but it was perfect. It was like a little Boston fern. And it was one of those holy moments. Because I looked at that and I said, you know, somehow this, and I'm looking down at, at the floor of the forest where there's a million ferns growing in the, in the perfect and verdant soil in the shade of the pine trees. And I'm thinking, you know, that seed could have landed anywhere, but obviously the wind caught it and blew it and it dropped down into this crack. I said, you know, I feel like I've fallen into a crack too. And I said, but the difference between me and this fern plant is that this, when that seed dropped in there, I don't think this, the fern seed was going, oh my God, I mean, why couldn't I have landed down there? Look at those conditions, they're so perfect and everything, and here I am in this crack. Because the fern seed doesn't have that kind of self-consciousness, that, that sense of evaluating the circumstances, of judging where it is in life. It, it is encoded with the DNA to grow, yes? To do, to grow where it finds itself. And whatever soil there, there might be in where it finds itself, even in this very inhospitable environment, this, this, this is not the ideal conditions, but it nonetheless gave sway to this, this impulse that it was encoded for to grow and to, to, to flourish the best that it could. And that was so helpful to me because I realized that I was still, I was in the dark. I was, I was, I was bemoaning my fate and not using whatever resources that were still available to me to, to expand and to grow and to make the best out of being in this crack. And that is a lesson, right, of falling upward. Yes? Falling upward. You're falling down. In other words, the plan didn't work out. You know, you didn't get what you wanted. There's a big disappointment. There's time for grief, which is appropriate. But then after that period of grief, it's time to say, how can I grow where I am right here? Because God doesn't leave you comfortless. God doesn't, is not missing from your life experience when you're in a difficult situation and only, you know, constantly available to you when life is going well. That's our version. That's the notion of a separated self. It isn't the truth. So that was huge for me. And it allowed me to begin to look for other opportunities. And I ended up getting uh, a, a crappy job and then a better crappy job, better than crappy job. <laughs> And then even a better job and then, until finally I was working as a, like an administrator in a hospital, uh, not, not a hospital administrator, but in a, one of the departments because I had this computer background work and so forth and in order to support the family. So that's how it can go. So um, in, the, in the forward to this Sunday book, I wrote this. It's not that we have to undergo trials to grow spiritually. It's not a universal law of being or a prerequisite for personal evolution. There have been great sages who have mastered the great spiritual truths through insight, not through pain, using meditation, mindfulness, and deep soul-searching practices. It is simply that great challenge often the catalyst for waking us up. Do we know this? Yeah? For seeing ourselves in life and value and meaning with the eyes that have been opened and hearts that have been broken open to a greater realization that our minds can comprehend. When we are dealt a major life blow, invariably all our major life perspectives are called into question. Our sense of security, identity, and mortality are laid open for examination. What we may have taken for granted, whether it was our health, success, security, status, or personal influence once lost, force us to re-identify ourselves without them. Who are we without money or when our health falters? Who am I when I no longer hold a job of authority or influence? When we are stripped of roles and vigor, worldly wealth or significant relationships, we can either be diminished by our losses or make them grist for a deeper search into self-realization 
beyond external. This is about taking the latter course. It's about using the difficulties of life to take us deeper into the truth of our essential nature. This is not Pollyannish, New Age whitewash, or spiritual mind candy, nor any attempt to gloss over the human condition. Certainly the loss of a loved one, personal bankruptcy, serious health risk, or the loss or the like can be enormously painful, and there is the need to experience and move through a period of grief. This process is not to be overlooked. And then there is the continuation of that healing, premised on the idea and borne out in every wisdom, wisdom tradition, from the teachings of Jesus to Lao Tzu, that holds that nothing that can be lost is part of your true self. That the immutable truths of love, peace, wholeness, and joy cannot be destroyed or diminished under any circumstances. Herein lies the hope that can carry us forward as we seek and uncover and experience the joy and the peace which lie undisturbed beneath the trial of the human condition. And lastly, and this will take us into a meditation. While we were going through that difficult journey, we had a very good friend who was wise and articulate in so many beautiful ways. You know, there's people that write books that are pretty good writers, and there's people that don't write books, and you say, why not? And Claudia, it was such a person. So she knew what we were going through, and she says, you can close your eyes if you want to. This is sort of a contemplation. She says, dear friends, I'm wishing for you to be able to surrender fully and rapturously into this depression moment, this confused state of perceived non-blessing, so that the real blessing might get a chance to bloom in its own way and its own rhythm. Efforting has always, always been my undoing while good things seem to have come in on an unstoppable tide. But the tide has to go out first, right? Yeah. I remember running on fumes of prayer when I couldn't pray anymore. So distrustful of God was I. But of course, unable to do anything besides pray. But that healed me. Did I tell you of that woman trapped in the rubble of the World Trade Center who was rescued after 80 hours? Asked what she did all the time, lying in pain and darkness, waiting for death. She said she did absolutely nothing but pray. The old saying, when you get to the place where I'm all you have, you'll see that I'm all you need. Let God and let God run your life. I absolutely prayerfully see you, Larry, you and Larry, shining in your ideal situation. But experience convinces me that there really is no ideal situation. Only the unwinding experience of attempting to harmonize with what arises in a given moment. And then the moment situation changes and like little boats, we rise on the next wave and attempt to harmonize with that one and that one and on and on. So that would be the shining part, the finished pirouette, the prow of the canoe cutting squarely into the oncoming wake, the gulping part, the fearing part, the failing part. This is just the back of the same moment. All God, and trusting that God is there in the trough, in the exhale, the low place, at least for me, feels deep and good. So there is so much gratitude in me and I know in you as well for the teachings that can take us from a low place and bring us into the light of a new day. Because we know that, as Jesus said, I do not leave you comfortless, but the spirit of truth comes after. That the circumstances and conditions of life are designed to be temporary, to be there and then to disappear, to dissolve. 
And the good days are not days in which we're getting everything we want. Good days are when life is doing whatever life is doing. And we have a deep, internal, unseverable connection with the truth of our own being, with life that has no beginning and has no end, with a, with a feeling of well-being that surpasses any appearance of lack knowing that we are being guided to a high and a holy peace that defies understanding to the human mind, but is absolutely consistent with the truth of God's love and life that never ends. So we thank you, Spirit, that as we go through this life, as we continue to embrace life on life's terms, that we will remain connected to the awareness of your presence and your power and your love that is constantly seeking to lift us to new heights, to new heights of possibility, to let go of what needs to die so that the new life can emerge. It is in, this, in the faith of this truth that we are uplifted and we are emboldened to move forward, no matter what, forever and ever through Whatever. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys.